Hello, this is Nicole Shekhawat from the University of Michigan Kellogg Eye Center uh, giving a talk on how to deliver effective presentations. So in brainstorming what I thought made an effective presentation based on my experiences of listening to people who are effective speakers, I came up with three things uh, that define for me an effective presentation. These are, these are just my personal thoughts. One is when I hear an effective presentation or see one, I, I pay attention. Second thing is I learn the key points that the speaker is trying to convey. And the third thing is I understand the relevance of whatever the speaker is trying to talk about. And so what that means is that an effective presentation is compelling, it provides clarity, and it provides context. So let's go through all of those terms and kind of deconstruct what they mean uh, in, in more specific detail. So a compelling presentation means you pay attention, but you have to think about what that term attention actually means. There's at least two types of attention. One is visual attention, meaning where you are looking with your eyes. And one is auditory attention, meaning the sounds that your ears are paying attention to and that your mind is paying attention to. Ideally, these two should be integrated uh, and in sync with one another. Kind of like when you're watching a action movie or watching somebody's mouth move when they're talking to you as part of a conversation. And that's useful because it preserves cognitive bandwidth. And this is a key concept in uh, learning how to manipulate people's attention is if you can seamlessly integrate people's visual and auditory attention, have them look at something while thinking about it and listening to you talk about it at the same time, that, it, that avoids unnecessary expenditure of mental energy. And so we're going to go through some visual design elements that hopefully uh, drive that point home on how to purposefully control people's visual attention and auditory attention in a way that gets them to uh, pay attention. And so here's a simple dot on a black screen. Uh, when you look at this, your eyes are immediately drawn to that dot. Uh, and then when I extend this dot into a line, your eyes start roving from left to right in a horizontal manner. And if I were to draw an arrowhead here, then your eyes would move from left to right. And this is useful for conveying the evolution of a process, if that's the concept you want to convey. In addition, a line can divide the top half of a page uh, from the bottom half of a page. Or if it's a vertical line, it can divide the left side from the right side. And so you can direct people's visual attention this way. Here's a shape, a simple area. And so at this point, your eyes are probably roving around somewhat aimlessly within the borders of the shape. I can change the color of the shape to elicit different moods or different levels of attention. And if I change the shape into two halves, then your eyes are actually bouncing around approximately equally between the left and the right halves of the shape. The other way I can manipulate your visual attention is by changing the shape into a spectrum of colors. And so at this point, your eyes are softly moving from the left side to the right side and back and forth. If I change the shape into multiple equally, shape, shape, equally sized shapes, as in a panel, your eyes will spend approximately an equivalent amount of time in all six of these shapes. And so this is useful for conveying, uh, uh, for, for presenting multiple ideas that are approximately equivalent or should be equivalent in the audience's mind. Uh, if I have a panel of three, this is actually quite useful because, again, your eyes are uh, spending an approximately equal amount of time in all three. Three, I find, is a very useful, almost magical number because it really is uh, an elegant way to convey ideas. And if I have sequential shading of these three, then your eyes, again, move in an ordered manner from left to right and right to left. And so you can really manipulate the way that the audience pays visual attention using simple visual cues like that. And the other element in all of this is the element of time. So if you present these visual cues in a very controlled manner at a very specific point in time, then you can almost uniformly direct the audience's visual attention exactly where you want and when you want. And if you integrate that with what you're talking about so that the auditory cues supplement the visual cues, then you really have good control of the audience's attention. Second thing is, what makes an effective presentation is clarity. So clarity is really difficult to unpack, and it's probably the most difficult thing to, to um, achieve in a presentation. So my idea of clarity is I learn the key points from a presentation. So you have to deconstruct what, is, what are you trying to have the audience learn. There are at least two levels to this. One is you're trying to have your audience learn facts. But more deeply, you're trying to have your audience learn and understand concepts. And so before you give a presentation, you should really try to delineate in your own mind what are the core facts and the core concepts that you're trying to convey. And some facts and concepts are more important than other facts and concepts. And so you really need to pay attention to structure. And I use the analogy of a building, like a house. Uh, and so you need to figure out what are the most foundational or important facts and concepts and what are the least, uh, the less important or unessential facts and concepts. And this, this 
this metaphor is quite useful for any type of presentation, whether it's a case presentation or a medical lecture or a research paper. And so think about a house. This is a picture of a house in India, actually. It took a long time to find these pictures. And right now, you're probably paying attention to all the finishings and the moldings and the paint and the shingles on this house. These are all the fancy external aspect of the house, but they're actually not the most important structural components. The most, structural, the most important structural component of a house is the foundation, which you may not see on first glance, but it's what keeps the house standing. And so in this metaphor, the foundations are the core intellectual assumptions or core knowledge or core concepts that the audience must know and understand and appreciate before they can get, uh, they, before they can advance to the finer points of your presentation. So you have to establish a good intellectual foundation for your talk. Spend time doing that and then, then you have the ability to talk about important but less fundamental uh, concepts or facts. And so these can be analogous to the beams of a house that hold up the walls. Then after that, in the house, you lay bricks uh, to fill in the walls of the house. And these are even less important, but still pretty important concepts and facts. Then after that, you put on the cement and the paint and the finishings. You have your house. But remember, you see the fancy stuff on the, on the, on the exter exterior of the house. But what really is important for the house to stand and what's really important for your talk to be well understood and to be clear to people is the structural foundations. So the most important facts and the most important concepts. So then that brings us to the next point, which is you learn the key points. And so that term means that you understand what matters most. And by the zero sum property, you understand what doesn't matter as much uh, in terms of the content of your talk. And so this is the principle of simplicity. Perfection, there's a quote from some French design guru from the 19th century. Perfection is not when you have nothing to add, it's when you have nothing to take away. This is surprisingly hard to achieve. It's very easy to cram in a bunch of often irrelevant or unnecessary information or visual and auditory cues into your presentation, thinking that you're being thorough and you can't go wrong with that. But often uh, when you do that, you're making a big mistake because you're de-emphasizing the most important parts of your presentation. And so the other uh, example you can think of is that, that of an iPhone. Simplicity is, is the ultimate sophistication, uh, Leonardo da Vinci said. And so when you think about a beautiful, elegant, but often underappreciated product like the iPhone, when you look at the exterior, it's quite simple. The, the user only sees what he or she needs to see. But on the inside of the phone is a very complex set of machinery that took millions of person hours to make uh, across many, many years of development. And the user never sees or appreciates these internal components which keep the phone running. That doesn't mean they're not there. They're just not essential for the user to see, but they're always there. But at the end, the end user interface is what the user absolutely has to see and nothing more. And so that's how you achieve clarity. Finally, you have to think about context. You understand the relevance of the talk. So what does that mean? For clinicians, it means the practical, clinical, or surgical implications of the talk. How does this change my practice on a day-to-day -day basis? But the other deeper way to think about relevance is what is the big picture? Where does my talk fit into the bigger context of my entire field or my sub subspecialty? And so the metaphor you can use uh, to understand this is uh, a map, where we are in the map how we got here and where we're about to go. And this applies for the uh, research, where it fits into the broader scheme of the entire field's research, but it also applies to any part of your presentation. Where in the presentation are you? Are you in the introduction, the methods, the result, or the conclusion? If the audience has a sense of context, they'll have a more intuitive grasp of uh, why you're saying what you're saying. And so think about a map. Tell them clearly, explicitly, where in the talk they are and where that talk fits in to the overall context of the entire field. And that way they will, uh, they will have context. We'll go through some common mistakes that I often see presenters make. Uh, these are mock-up slides, which took a surprisingly long amount of time, because when you're deliberately making mistakes, it's, it's a painful experience, uh, as you'll see. And so the most common mistake is this one, where you have an excessive amount of text um, that is basically paragraphs turned into bullet form. So you, people will write a paper, and then they have to give a talk on it. And instead of doing the difficult work of s simplifying their talk, uh, their paragraphs down to uh, bullet points, they actually just convert the paragraphs directly into bullet points. And so I'm going to actually read this verbatim because it's painful for you to hear that, and it hopefully drives the point home that you should not read it verbatim. 
Excessive, excessive amounts of text make it difficult for the audience to follow along as the speaker reads the words from his or her slides verbatim. Instead of simply listening to the speaker, the audience spends most of their mental energy trying to read the words in the slides. Invariably, the audience reads the words before the speaker gets to them, resulting in disjointed timing of verbal versus visual input from the words. This is bad because the ideal communication should perfectly sync auditory and visual input, just like a regular conversation or watching a movie. Overly fancy font adds no value to the slides, but simply makes it more difficult for readers to, to discern what the words on the screen are. Perhaps the worst offender is when there is insufficient contrast between the colors of the words and the background. This causes significant eye strain and reduces the audience's attention. Taken together, all of these factors reduce the audience's cognitive bandwidth for understanding the content of the talk. This, in turn, reduces internalization of facts and concepts, thereby inhibiting learning. Even as I was reading all these words, your mind was probably drifting because it was boring to hear me read words that you can already read on your own. And so don't, just don't do this. And the other thing is your eyes are probably strained from trying to make out, just, just trying to visually see and pay attention to these words given the lack of contrast in the background. This is a common mistake that you should try to avoid. The other mistake I see is the quote-unquote busy slide, and I often kind of judge people who say that this is a busy slide before they show their busy slide because it means that they knew they were making a mistake with having a busy slide, and they chose not to do anything to correct that mistake. If you have a busy slide, I think you should make your slide less busy and offload the work uh, from that slide onto some other slides. And so the mistake here is that you have a tremendous amount of information, often numerical, and you are verbally just talking about these numbers and providing no visual cues uh, for where in the slide the audience should be paying attention. And so the audience's eyes are roving all over trying to discern which numbers you're referring to verbally. Uh, and they end up getting a lot less, uh, having a lot less cognitive bandwidth left over to pay attention to the actual content you're referring to at any point in time. And so rather than th having this, you should have, uh, you should very carefully visually and um, auditorily walk people through the slides so that they pay, pay attention to, the exact, to exactly the part of the table that, that you want them to pay attention to. The third mistake, which is often egregious, is when people do the other extreme where they have too many stimuli uh, of various colors and sizes uh, because they think it's cute to put in animations for no reason uh, and to make things color themed and so on for no reason. I, the general principle you should follow is that everything you put in your PowerPoint slide uh, or in, in your presentation should have a purpose to it. So unnecessary uh, stimuli just end up wasting the audience's cognitive bandwidth yet again, visual and auditory. And that means they have left less mental energy left over to pay attention to what, you, what they really need to pay attention to. And the other thing is they have unnecessary auditory stimuli, which don't add any value to the presentation. So at that point, it's difficult to intuitively follow along with the sequence of visual and auditory cues because your eyes are roving all over the place. And the other thing is that your attention is diverted, uh, and this expends valuable cognitive bandwidth on the unnecessary task of searching. Also, try not to use Comic Sans unless you're teaching preschool. And so with this visual vomit, uh, it just ends up uh, negating the value of the fundamentals you're trying to convey in your presentation. Here are some examples of uh, what I've done to try to convey information more elegantly. Uh, you can be the judge of whether these were effective or not, but hopefully it drives the point home that everything visually should have a purpose and you should control the timing of when people pay attention to, to that thing. And so some, here are some of the tools that I use uh, in my presentations. Uh, one thing I use is that of a cent central theme or visual motif. So a recurring image can anchor the audience's uh, mind in a, in a concept that's core to the, to the talk. So for example, in a recent talk we gave on varicella zoster virus and the epidemiology of herpes zoster ophthalmicus, this is the first image we showed. This is a simple image of a virus. There is no text or labels or anything else. But immediately the audience uh, was cued in that this was a talk about viral transmission. And so when we show that image again, they knew, they got it, that this is, this is we're talking about viruses again. Uh, recently, we gave a talk on topiramate-induced angle closure glaucoma, and the opening image for that talk was that of the molecule for the drug topiramate. So uh, rapidly, the audience immediately knew that this was a talk about a drug reaction. And so when we showed this molecular picture again, they got it, that this was about the drug. Uh, in a talk we gave about trachoma transmission across uh, different age groups of children, we showed a picture of a Tanzanian family 
And we showed this at the start as well as the conclusion of the talk. Uh, and the audience understood, hopefully, that this was a talk about intergenerational transmission of trachoma. And so these anchoring images can be very powerful subconscious cues to get the audience to uh, refer back to something you've already talked about and presented visually in, in an earlier part of your presentation. Um, thinking about linear progression, you can really control the audience's eye movements this way and explain somewhat complicated comp concepts like disease pathophysiology this way. And note that you really don't have to have animations. Here I do show animations, but these are not necessary. You don't have to be an expert at PowerPoint animations in order to use, um, use visual cues in a controlled manner. So this is a uh, diagram showing the pathophysiology of herpes osteophthalmicus. It starts with a uh, primary VZV infection known as varicella or chickenpox. Then the virus establishes latency within the dorsal root ganglia. And so this dormant VZV li infection lies there for many years or decades and later on it can reactivate to cause herpes zoster or shingles. And so hopefully the audience's uh, visual attention moved from left to right. I control their visual attention very precisely with the element of time, thanks to my animation. And so by the end of it, they understood uh, the pathophysiology of the disease. This is a grand rounds we gave on a case of neurosarcoidosis, which was initially misdiagnosed as uh, optic neuritis. And so the patient initially presented with a unilateral optic neuritis. The CT chest was negative, neuromyelitis optica, uh, antibodies, and autoimmune labs are all negative. Uh, she came back with recurrence of the optic neuritis in the same location, and at this point they were considering a diagnosis of atypical optic neuritis. Later on they considered whether she had NMO spectrum disorder. Later on they began to entertain the notion that she might have sarcoidosis, but then she was lost to follow up for several months and came back with florid granulomatous inflammation and the biopsy confirmed neurosarcoidosis. So this way we kind of summarize your entire clinical course visually in one slide instead of across several slides. This is perhaps one of the more complicated diagrams we've had to make to try to explain how we collect information on the occurrence of a disease across uh, multiple age groups and multiple years. And so in any given year of our study, we had children of several age groups. We had the babies, age zero, and then we had ages one, two, three, four, and five. And these are all children of different age groups observed in one particular year, say the year 2004. And so we counted the occurrence of a disease across all of these age groups in that year. And we came back one year later. And as children tend to do, they grow older. And so all the babies became one year old. The one year olds became two year olds. And so everybody, everybody aged by one year. And in the meantime, a new crop of babies was born. And so in the year two of our study, uh, we had an additional uh, panel of children who we, we assessed the prevalence of disease in. And so this progressed year after year so that we had uh, more and more crops of babies being born and the previously studied children became older by one year every year. And so with this structure, you can look at the occurrence of a disease in three ways. One, you can look at the age-specific incidence. So what is the incidence of trachoma, for example, in babies from the year 2004 to 2005, 2006, and 2007. So across multiple years, what is the age-specific uh, incidence of this disease? The other way you can look at uh, incidence is period-specific, meaning in any given year uh, of the study, what is the uh, frequency of a disease across all the different age groups? Um, and then the third way you can look at the occurrence of a disease is cohort-specific incidence. So in this class of children, as they grew older year after year, how did, their, how did this group of children's uh, prevalence or incidence of disease change over time? And that's cohort-specific incidence. So hopefully this diagram with judicious use of color coding and, and linear uh, visual flow establishes these rather complicated concepts of age, period, and cohort effects uh, in a way that makes it clear what we're trying to measure in a study. The other way you can quickly uh, establish visual cues is, uh, take advantage of visual cues, is by uh, setting up comparisons. And so this is often just uh, left versus right side of the screen. And so we had a study that uh, was, we thought, an advancement over prior studies, but we, we wanted to demonstrate why. And so we compared prior studies, which uh, assessed the concept of efficacy, which is the performance of an intervention under ideal testing conditions or explanatory trials. We contrasted that with our study, which assessed effectiveness, which is the performance of this intervention under in real world settings, and that's what a pragmatic trial is. And so with, again, judicious use of color coding and perfect alignment horizontally of these uh, visual cues, we set up an effective contrast between prior research and our own research. This is uh, a list of all the different surveys that exist for measuring vision-related quality of life. 
And rather than reading out all these different surveys, all I did was color code them based on traffic light colors. So red is bad, yellow is okay, but not that great, and green is good. And so this way we knew, the audience hopefully quickly understood which surveys are good to use and which surveys are bad to use. Here's a before and after diagram, a global um, prevalence of blindness uh, as depicted on the distortion map compared to the number of practicing ophthalmologists. And so the simple before and after really drives home the point that there's a discrepancy where the need of the patient population is and where the actual uh, location of the practicing ophthalmologist in the world is. Sim simple before and after contrast. And here's another study we did at the Arvin Vision Centers explaining how vision centers work through four images showing that uh, fundus photography is only used some of the time, and with the intervention in our new trial, we mandated that fundus photography be used all the time with this new camera. And so just using this visual cue alone, the audience rapidly understood what the intervention was. Ideally, uh, your use of visual cues should be so elegant and effective that if you were to present your talk to a foreign audience that did not even understand your your language, they would still get the fundamentals of what you're trying to convey. That's the ideal you should try to strive for in terms of simplicity. You can divide a topic into various parts. And so uh, when, you, when I gave a lecture on pediatric keratoplasty, I made it very clear which part of the talk we were on and what the three parts were. And so every, at the start of every section, I said, we're talking now about indications. We're now talking about techniques. We're now talking about outcomes. And so the audience kind of followed along linearly with the map of the presentation that way. This is a study we did on outcomes of flanged uh, intraskeletal haptic fixation techniques at our institution. And so uh, we wanted to differentiate between eyes that had good pre-existing visual potential, meaning they didn't have any maculopathy or corneal scarring that would limit their acuity, and eyes that had limited visual potential due to various pre-existing comorbidities. And so this way you visually divide the eyes into two categories. This is a study that we did on how many patients who are diagnosed with acute conjunctivitis end up getting antibiotics. And so this is a big data analysis of 340,000 patients. And so of those, 42% did not get antibiotics, and 58% did get antibiotics. And of the 58% that did get antibiotics, we wanted to see who got what type of antibiotics. And so uh, one-third got fluoroquinolones, half got non-fluoroquinolones, and crucially 20% got antibiotic corticosteroid combinations which are discouraged uh, from being used in this condition. And so this uh, convenient breakdown really made it clear the, the key finding of the study. And we also went ahead and used this color combination, blue versus red, for the rest of the study to compare people who did and didn't receive antibiotics. So we kept that consistent color coding. This was a flow chart of the different types of optic neuritis. So before we talk about optic neuritis, we wanted to establish what isn't optic neuritis, and so we ruled out mimickers of optic neuritis. Then we talked about the two different types of optic neuritis, typical optic neuritis and atypical optic neuritis. And this way, again, the audience visually understood the, understood the different categories of this condition. You can sort information in rather complicated ways that make it easy to understand using color coding and various techniques like that. So in a surgical outcome study, we had visual, refractive, and anatomic outcomes that we wanted to measure. And here's all the different data that we collected at the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative phases of the study. Now this can be very complicated to figure out what's what, which is a visual, refractive, or anatomic outcome. But again, with judicious use of color coding, the audience intuitively understood that visual means preoperative versus postoperative visual acuity, refractive means preoperative biometry, intraoperative use of IOLs and what uh, refractive power you would expect from using that particular IOL, and postoperative measurement of the actual square, spherical equivalent of refraction. And anatomic meant assessment of the IOL position in the eye using ultrasound biomicroscopy. This was, again, a complicated concept that we tried to convey visually. Uh, this is a stepped wedge cluster randomization scheme, which is not very commonly used in our field. Uh, but we thought it was an effective way to test the uh, effect of an, of an intervention. And so uh, we had four uh, study sites uh, in the Arvind Eye Care System. And we studied them over five two-week time periods, so for a total of 10 weeks. And so in the first two-week time period, everybody, all four study sites, were uh, using the standard of care. And with the, at, at the second two-week time period, one of the study sites crossed over to the intervention, which is routine photography, and stayed there. And at the start of each new time period, one more of the study sites crossed from the control group, or the, which is blue, to the intervention group, which is yellow. And so this way, we can combine data from the, from the patients that were in the control group and compare that to the data from the patients in the intervention group. And this is how you randomize uh, the two, the two uh, groups. 
And this step budge cluster randomization scheme is quite difficult to convey until people see the diagram. Then they more intuitively understand how the randomization scheme works. You can sort a category into subcategories. And so this is a panel showing different images uh, of manifestations of herpes zoster ophthalmicus. I took pains to make sure that the images were the same height so that your eyes are roughly visually paying the same amount of attention to all six images. I could have gone even further and made sure that this, these images were the same horizontal dimension or width as these, but I didn't. Uh, but one of the mistakes I see people making is that they put, on, put up a bunch of random images of varying sizes haphazardly on a screen. And that ends up confusing the audience. Their, their eyes are bouncing around instead of floating in a controlled manner equally across the different images. Uh, and here I wanted to convey that uh, epithelial keratitis, scleritis, uh, discoform keratitis, corneal scarring and epithelial uh, defects, and uh, skin rashes, they're all equally important in understanding herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And so hopefully, because the audience's eyes are spending an equal amount of time approximately uh, in all six images, that is an intuitive understanding for them. Here's a sequential rollout of images showing the pathophysiology of trachoma. First, there's a chlamydia trachomatis infection. Then the patient develops re recurrent bouts of follicular trachoma. And eventually, this causes scarring or trachiasis, which can be a blinding condition. This was a talk given to a non-clinical audience, but they rapidly understood what the process for developing trachiasis is this way, because their eyes move from the top left of the screen to the middle to the bottom right of the screen, as I talked about them. Here are the three different types of Lefort fractures. Right now, your eyes are spending an approximately equal amount of time in type 1, 2, and 3. The other really important thing, especially for tables, which can be busy, is guided narration, where you uh, talk about something as the audience is looking at that thing. And so here's a busy slide where we talk about the demographic characteristics of people who took a medication versus people who didn't take a medication. And so I wanted to talk about differences in age, and so at that point I highlighted the uh, cells that talk about age, and I said that uh, the red category, new to pyramid users, approximately half of them were uh, young, meaning age 21 to 40, whereas the non-users were far older. 20% uh, of them were 61 to 80 years old, and 3.2% of them were 81 or older, and that was a statistically significant difference. There was a substantial difference in the gender distribution across the blue and the red categories, and I just said that 80% of the new to permanent users were female, whereas, only, whereas there was a 50-50 split in the non-users. And there were important racial differences in these two groups, where 80% of new to permanent users are white, very few are Asian, and in the control or the blue group, 4.2% were Asian. And so when I go through all of these, the audience's eyes are moving along with what I'm saying. They're not roving around, scrutinizing the tables, trying to figure out which text I'm referring to. They know exactly what I'm talking about as I'm talking about it. Similar concept here, this is a complicated statistical model showing risk factors for herpes zoster ophthalmicus, but I just go, I first talk about the fact that females have an 8.8% higher hazard ratio for developing the condition. Then I talk about how blacks, Latinos, and Asians have a substantially lower risk of developing the condition compared to whites. Then I talk about how higher income has a higher uh, risk associated with developing the condition, as does higher level of education, as does rural location, as does a higher level of systemic comorbidity. So again, visually, your eyes flow with downward in the manner that I want and the, with the timing that I want. And so you're paying attention to what I'm talking about verbally. So your attention is not divided. Here is, again, a busy graph. These, this is, uh, the x-axis is age, and the y-axis is incidence, of, incidence rate of herpes ostrothalmicus. And each line represents a separate year in which the incidence was observed and measured across all different age groups. This is very complicated. But then if you sequentially show uh, the specific years of observation, you drive home the point that the incidence is increasing over time. And so first I showed the first four years of observation, then the next four, and then the last few years. And I showed that, again, very intuitively you can tell, the incidence of this disease is increasing year after year after year. It's really important to emphasize key points, especially when you have a lot of words on the screen. And so this is a slide without any color coding. And you know I can read this verbally. Even then, you wouldn't pay attention. But if I just put it up there, your eyes are kind of roll, roving all over the place, and you don't know what's more important, what's less important. Here, I just color coded the key numbers that you really needed to know and the, near, the key take home points that you really needed to know. Uh, I even went, so, even went so far as using yellow for things that are important. Uh, and red for things that are important, but also kind of bad. And that's just intuitive 
red is bad. And so uh, the yellow highlights the key number that the audience should try to take away, which is that this drug complication occurs in one out of every 2,500 to 3,000 patients. The red highlights that this is way more of a frequency than previously reported. And uh, the red also highlights that the previous reports uh, were underestimating the frequency of this damaging side effect. And the yellow, again, highlights that increased awareness is needed. So this is the context. Context meaning that this is what clinicians need to know from the talk, that they should be vigilant for this condition. Same concept here. This is a non-color-coded slide. And here's the same slide with color coding. Again, just highlighting the numbers and the terms that you really need to take away from this. I'm a big fan of supplementary slides, where you have an elegant, simple, pared-down talk that only dwells on the essentials. But then, if you want, you have a bunch of extra information available on hand uh, to bring up if the audience asks a, qu a complicated question. And so the metaphor to think about here is an iceberg. Uh, icebergs, there's a lot of depth under the surface, which is hidden uh, when, you're, when you're only looking at it from the surface. But uh, that's what your presentation should be like. You should only present what's essential up top, but have done all your homework, all your research, uh, and have all your supplementary information available on command under the surface if necessary. And so uh, here's just a list of supplementary slides that I had before the talk on pyramid-induced angle closure glaucoma, where I was able to go into great detail about the different phases of clinical trials, the different uh, details of the study design, as well as uh, additional supplementary results, which I didn't go over in the presentation for due to a limitation of time and because I thought it was too complicated to initially show. But if the audience had any questions on this, which they usually don't, then I was able to pull these up effortlessly and go into detail. So I'd done my homework, I just chose not to show it. So to review, uh, what makes an effective presentation? These are my own thoughts, uh, but I think the effective presentation is compelling, it's clear, and it provides context, meaning you pay attention, you learn the key points, and you understand the relevance and so what you need to do on a practical level is take pains to preserve the audience's cognitive bandwidth for actually understanding your talk. Don't waste their mental energy. Coordinate their visual and auditory attention uh, and make sure it goes toward actually understanding the material. Keep things simple. This is really hard to do well, but you have to work at it. These simple slides that I made took longer to make than meets the eye because I had to cut out a lot of non-essential information, but it's completely worth it in terms of effective communication. Maintain structure. Uh, figure out what the most important concepts and facts are that you're trying to convey and really drive those home because without those, everything else is uh, fluff. And provide context as to why it matters. And so in, in that spirit, I'll explain why communication matters. Um, it doesn't matter how good of a clinician or surgeon you are or how excellent your research work may be. If you fail to communicate those ideas effectively, you're not going to get the credit that you deserve for all your hard work and all your talents. And in addition, you're going to fail to uh, convey your findings to the world in a way that makes the world a better place through your work. And so both in terms of personal career uh, advancement and in terms of medical advancement, it's extremely important for you to learn how to communicate well. And so my hope is that uh, some of these uh, pieces of advice that I've given here will help you next time you're trying to give a talk, uh, especially a PowerPoint talk, but really any kind of talk, uh, in order to be more effective at communication. Thank you.